live now. I think that, yeah, I'm getting a message saying live. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So anyway, I, you heard all of me, I would imagine, all about me. So I will uh, not waste any more time and assume that at least uh, amongst the panelists, uh, we, we are introduced. And I'd like to invite uh, everybody to introduce uh, each other by turn. And it's fastest finger first. So anybody who would like to vol volunteer uh, can go first. No particular order. Go ahead, please. Any, uh, how you want to start? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm Andrew Natchison. I'm Chief Communications Officer for the National Community Reinvestment Coalition in the United States. Um, uh, my work and interests um, have focused on media technology and how we know what we know. Uh, my career began as a journalist, and that led me to work and curiosity not only with information and storytelling, but also technology, creativity, and the complex fabric of network knowledge and culture. Um, uh, and, and the context for the work that I've done in the past and what I'm doing now um, is, you know, really the emergence of the web and network knowledge and culture uh, and the transformation of society that that has uh, driven. Um, that transformation is still underway. Humanity still isn't fully networked. The digital divide is still a problem, even in the United States. Um, but we have transitioned from a world of what I call the media, the institutions through which we know what we know, um, to a world of we media, uh, which is defined and controlled by everyone, by us. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, that for me leads to the both the opportunities for innovation uh, and also the complexities and um, trauma uh, of dealing with a world in which we are drowning in information uh, and don't know what to do with it. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at that to give others a chance to introduce themselves um, and I can talk more later. Sure. Thank you. OK, Great. you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead, Avi. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Paul, for joining today. And uh, thanks to Arun, Frank Jurgen Richter, and all my co-panelists uh, for this important session uh, where it gives us an opportunity to discuss uh, potential pathways for innovation for shared humanity. Uh, and I think just as uh, uh, right now we heard from Andrew that there have been, and unfortunately there still remain, injustices you know, present in societies uh, that have not been it right, right? So internal to US where we live and more broadly around the world, we ha now have an obligation uh, that we can ensure that societies address these injustices, which is why we are, I guess, having this session today and also work to ensure promise of the future is uh, available to all without inequities, right? Especially during these times of pandemics and tur turbulence over the last year, such efforts in the United States and abroad have been historically also for less than diverse, less than inclusive, and also less than representative of societies and communities. This needs to be fixed. Uh, just as a quick background of myself, I've always been in technology and built tech companies in different um, industries, previously mainly in telecom. Uh, we were actually had uh, our own investment from IFC in my last uh, business. But uh, right now I have created a company which is focused on the huge protection gap that exists in the insur insurance industry today, where more than 4 billion people are not covered and also close to 3 billion are agri-dependent. So we are focusing our energy on sort of unprepared poor farmers around the world. And more we'll discuss based on the topic as to how that can be potentially uh, one, of, one of the uh, ways of um, sharing um, um, the innovation for humanity. Thank you, Ami. Uh, Amir, you want to go ahead? You say Amir? Yes. Uh, how do you pronounce your hey. name, Amir? Exactly the way you did. I just couldn't okay. hear it. <laughs> hey, my name is Amir Rubin. I am a CEO of a company called Six Sense. We focus on immersive computing and the use of it in healthcare and education. Um, we uh, identified, uh, I identified back in the 90s 
and then uh, continue in a certain level of obsession uh, through the up and down of the 90s with VR and through uh, the last uh, 27 years, all the way to uh, launching um, in 2009 and, uh, and, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the last 12 years, in 2009, we launched a, a trade skill training platform working with Lincoln Electric to teach, uh, using virtual reality, teach uh, a welding, uh, using virtual reality, teaching uh, in a way where you can uh, overcome limitation of danger. For example, in prisons, they're not allowed to actually hold the torch. So prisoners able to come, convicts come back to the to the economy uh, and many, many, you know, uh, veterans coming back from uh, um, from war, etc. And then today, it's a very big and very successful uh, a program for Lincoln Electric, which is the largest wealthy company in the world. We've done the same for other trade skills, from spray painting to electronics, and you know, uh, and other type of uh, of uh, education programs. And then we moved. Uh, to, to healthcare, and the important thing about that is is the objective of using technology to democratize healthcare and education. Healthcare, we partner with a company called Penumbra, a public company in the healthcare space uh, as a medical device. We focus on rehabilitation, allowing people to get rehabilitation, uh, you know, anywhere they are, uh, by not only bringing in to therapists tools that are proven to be more effective to actually treat their patients for both uh, physical therapies, uh, cognitive rehab, and uh, also uh, uh, mental health. We now, uh, with the great push by the pandemic, seeing this uh, openness on the governments, FDA specifically in the US, on allowing us to bring telehealth as a as a component so telehealth is going to be the big next push that uh will again democratize education and healthcare thank you amar that's a very impressive uh impressive resume <laughs> and we'd love to hear more about it as we go along uh Aaron, maybe you want to go next thank you yes thank you arun and thank you to the panelists and of course to frank who's brought together this discussion you know i loved hearing my fellow panelists introduce themselves because each of them is focused on solving a problem in a way that no one had thought about before. So it's, it's, it's an honor to be here on this panel. My name is Aaron Sherinian. I am the Vice President for Transformation Communications at a company that you probably have heard about, Philip Morris International. But what you may or may not have heard about is that the company has made an announcement to do one of the biggest transformations in the corporate world of, of, of its kind, mm -hmm. and that is to move away as quickly as possible from uh, combustible cigarettes. And uh, that is part of a commitment to shareholders to do it in a way that um, uh, that continues to return to employees in a way that is uh, is, uh, is sustainable. And then, of course, to society. And in the words of our leadership and something that you can find on, on any of our public uh, documents right now, the, the commitment to society that expects us to do better. So how do you take the opportunity to help people move from something that they're doing, smoking combustible cigarettes, to a better alternative. And uh, that's happening in places where we can see with independent research like Japan and in other places, an acceleration to moving to better alternatives, which we know is an innovation that can lead to what we're going to talk about today, which are the SDGs and a better humanity. So we'll talk about those things before. I happen to be a believer in innovation. I happen to believe that whether it's the $8.1 billion of Philip Morris's budget or the great ideas that are looking for financing among some of the projects and some of the smaller, amazing work that's going on. We're all part of that same trajectory for a better future. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, uh, last but not certainly the least, uh, Michael, uh, you'd like to introduce yourself. Hey guys, Michael Furtick. I'm in Palo Alto, California today. I've started a couple of companies you may have heard of, including like this one, Reputation. And I'm also the founder of a venture fund called Heroic Ventures. And you may know that we invest only in Silicon Valley in Israel. 
and only companies in which we can be in the first financing. So we are not seed investor, or pre-seed, or A, whatever it might be called. We are first money investors. And we've been in business for about five and a half years. It's heroic. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you, everyone, uh, you know, for uh, the introductions. Uh, I think it sets the stage for a fascinating discussion uh, because I think all of you are... Uh, you know, major achievers in your own, own fields and one way or the other pretty intimately linked to to the topic, I guess, which is the reason Frank asked, uh, you know, this group to be formed because I think it is a rich group with very direct engagement with uh, the topic. So just to set the frame for what we're talking about today, I just wanted to make a couple of opening remarks. I mean, in terms of this whole idea of a shared humanity, I mean, it's been talked about and um, you know, it's a known concept for a long, long time, uh, but yeah, I don't think it has ever kind of been brought home in reality uh, as it has you know, in the last 14 months or so with the pandemic. And uh, so there are many, many examples I could give or all of us could give, but I'd like just use to use only one to set the stage, which is the whole issue around the shared humanity around the innovation around vaccines, where everybody on this panel and everybody else uh, you know, in the seven, eight billion population today, you know, is is concerned with and uh, and how do you how do you get uh, you know this innovation to benefit everybody more safely, quickly, equitably uh, is is an issue around uh, which this whole whole question is centered. Uh, how do you get in everybody to share? in enormous innovation that's occurring because the pace of innovation which is another subject whatsoever is also ex you know increasing in geometric progression as more capability generates more innovation capacity and so on and so forth but the question is then how do you get people to share it and the vaccines is a very very sort of telling and live example so and you know there again i don't want to go into all the issues that are involved but simply put i think there are three kind of lessons already emerging from the discussion so far. One is everybody's got to participate in the process. It's not one person's responsibility. You know, it's not the government. You know, it is not the healthcare sector alone. It's everybody, you know. So so that's, that's so everyone's a stakeholder in this, uh, in this activity. The second thing is that, you know, in our traditional sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of business mindset, which is, you know, commercially, the correct mindset, which is a competitive mindset, you know, we have to do better than the competition in order to produce the best outcomes for society. But I think, I know at this point, I think that that whole idea of, of competition has is kind of, I think, has to be tempered with collaboration. You know, you can compete for, uh, uh, you know, doing the best possible, uh, get the best uh, possible outcome. But in the end, that competition has to be tempered with the fact that you have to work with everybody to generate a, an outcome that's the best for everyone, not just for yourself. And and this kind of you know brings me to the third sort of lesson that I see emerging, which is uh, that you know in a in a traditional sort of commercial world, you know you are there are the concepts of you know it's a reality that yes they are win wins, but uh, there are also you know a general focus on, you know, getting the best deal. You know, I'm the winner of this deal relative to my counterpart. That's how how, how, how how reality works. But I think now in this kind of situation where we are trying to build a shared humanity, I think there is, I think, got to be a realization more broadly uh, that not really there are, either we are all winners or we are all losers. So if the pandemic gets everybody there, you know, we are safe in the U.S., for example. But we're not really Till such time as everybody, who knows, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, strain might emerge in a, in a place which is, does not have the benefit of vaccines for the next two or three years, for example. Or if where people are essentially subject to really sub-quality vaccine or vaccine fraud, all kinds of things I don't want to go into. But the fact is that either we win together or we lose together. So I think it, it is these three kind of emerging lessons that... Uh, you know, I'm kind of getting out of the uh, out, out out of this particular development around vaccines, 
and this and and I think this example is shared across literally everything we all do, and uh, which brings me to my my first question, which is for our panelists, which and I'll just go around the room uh, with that is in your work. Uh, how do you see the uh, changes that you need to make or the adjustments you need to make in managing your business and your business model towards accommodating this type of uh, approach to a more uh, shared humanistic approach or where you have essentially a responsiveness towards not only your traditional stakeholders but a much broader where effectively humanity becomes your shareholder one way or the other in your given context. So I'll start with, with you, uh, Aaron. I, I just want to know, it looks like we've got another speaker. Um, Kim Hi, Cole. it's, yeah, it's, it's Kim. Kim. Yeah, I will see you, Kim. Yes, um, unfortunately, I'm having a few technical difficulties, but I hope you can hear me. I can. So Kim, uh, thanks. Thank, uh, great to have you. Could you quickly introduce yourself as well? Certainly. Um, I'm Kim Folsom. I'm the founder, chairperson, and CEO of Founders First Capital Partners. And we are a social economic uh, impact investment platform where we focus on funding and growing diverse founder businesses to become um, the next mid-market uh, job creators. Um, we're based in the U.S. and have been at this for going on six years. Excellent. And where are you based, Kim? Uh, so we're based in San Diego, California, but we have presence in uh, Texas, Illinois, and next quarter will be uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Oh, fabulous. So you, you, you'll be closer to us on the East Coast then. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Great. Uh, well, Kim, uh, you, uh, sorry again for missing, uh, missing you out because uh, we could not see you and there was no even, uh, not even a name indication uh, mm -hmm. on my screen, uh, but... Uh, I imagine you were able to hear the conversation so far. I, I can. And I heard your questions that you posed as well. Perfect. So then, you know, since we missed you out in the beginning, why don't we let you go first with the first response to the question I just posed? Sure. Um, so I think that um, there's got to, even though, you know, I I just went on a workation and there was a book I was reading, Peter, Peter Thier, Zero to One, that there's this perception that you can't do good and do well. But I tell you, I think that there is going to be, there has to be a win-win on both sides. Um, this whole uh, premise that you bring about vaccine is a significant source of capital for a lot of people, not your traditional source of capital, but it's going to be a source of doing good and doing well and really going to be a splitting point between the haves and the have-nots of economic economies. And um, so there's got to be that... Um, you know, benefits uh, to to making that that work. Um, what, the work that we do with Founders First is we partner with a number of institutional investors, such as Rockefellers, Mark MacArthur, and those types of organizations, as well as major corporations, to uh, advance um, you know diverse founder-led businesses. Um, and you know, some people may ask, well, why why do that? You know, you could focus on the main ones, but you know, that is a growing portion of the consumer base. And if you're wanting to grow your market share and grow the overall economy, you've got to invest in that um, diverse um, founder base. So I think the whole, you know, do good and do well will drive um, some of these changes uh, with regards to uh, the oh, at, a, at a global scale. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, this is this is most exciting. Again, you know, as uh, you know, as IFC, I've been doing that for the last thirty years. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that. Uh, the idea is uh, of doing well and doing good is mainstreamed across all all arms of uh, all types and all strata of business across the world. So mm -hmm. certainly an exciting time uh, uh, and, and, and probably needed more than ever before. So uh, I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Aaron continue and after that, Michael. Thanks. I think, you know, Arun and, and welcome, Kim. I'm Andrew. Good catch. I didn't realize that Kim had joined us. So we're so glad that, that we're all here. You know, you set us up, Arun, perfectly when you said at the end of your questions, humanity is our shareholder. You know, we have an important uh, uh, role that we have to play and a duty to our shareholders and those who are the investors and those who are our employees. But humanity is our shareholder. It's key. One of the things that I think 
as a communications person, I want to make sure we remember in this shared humanity reality we have is that in the development or philanthropy world, oftentimes you'll hear that phrase, an important phrase, nothing about them without them. No interventions for economic progress or, or public health or education. Nothing should ever be designed without the constituents in mind who are the people who are going to be helping make sure that this is possible, your stakeholders, whether they're your end users of a, of a program, the regulators who make it happen, civil society as the people who drive it. And as we're looking at the shared humanity, the vaccination example is important. I look at the work that PMI is doing, and you have to be talking to the people who are going to be either utilizing these innovations, who say they need the innovations, the regulators who are going to be making it possible. I want to make sure that as we look at this new era, we're not forgetting that old adage that works and was commonly applauded in the philanthropy and development space. It's just as important in the innovation space. Nothing should be designed or deployed or, or really regulated about or talked about without them, the meaning of the people. And then the second piece is that in the haves and haves not world, misinformation or the blocking of information about something that might be a better innovation, I hope that we've learned over this past year, year and a half, that access to solid scientific information or access to information about what may, might be available as an innovation in anything, I hope that that can be seen as a universal. That is a have or have not situation we can more easily equalize, the access to basic information can't do everything immediately. It takes time and effort and, and all of the resources. But those are some initial thoughts coming from. from. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Michael? Uh, thanks. You know, when I think about this topic, I think about the failed promise of Silicon Valley in some ways. Uh, it would not be unfair to say if you were someone visiting Silicon Valley, you guys promised us flying cars, and what you gave us was Twitter. And that's a fair charge. It's a fair objection. It's especially fair because I think um, Aaron, who is, of course, on important corporate message, no knock on him, doing beautifully, by the way, um, as he intimated, well, he didn't intimate, but as you might intimate, as I might say, based on a theme that is similar to the one he was evoking, it's not yet clear to me or to us that democracy and the Internet are going to prove to be compatible. There's a lot of bad info out there, <clears throat> in part due to some of the gifts that we have given, Twitter versus flying cars. So Silicon Valley, which is, a, which is, a, which is both a place and a metaphor, <laughs> Uh, is, a, is, a, is a place with a lot of virtues. One of them is that you can kind of come from anywhere here and kind of propose anything very, very novel here, and at least someone will take you seriously, which is untrue of anywhere else that I've ever been or I'm aware of. But we also have some vices. Um, somewhere along the line, when we built Silicon Valley, we forgot irony, right? Irony is not a, an ingredient here. Humor is not an ingredient here. This has become a very deeply religious place that is humorless um, and joyless in a lot of ways. And we, in the, in the place of humor, we use the religious zeal of something called mission, which is often just a cover story for something else. <clears throat> and uh, we often pound the table about virtue signaling rather than evoking or evincing virtue. Now, having said all that, um, the thing that we can do about it is to seek to allocate some portion of our time, some portion of our capital, for those things that will be breakthrough technologies that can provide new and interesting ways to recreate yourself as a human, to educate yourself as a human and to profit as a human, build wealth for yourself and your family, access to goods and services for your family and people you love or for your government. If in case it's corrupt and needs a uh, decorrupting agency. Um, okay. Those are all good things. Um, but 
it takes a little bit of extra courage, a little bit of extra zeal to invest in those technologies and those companies that are actually are better for humanity rather than neutral or possibly worse. Uh, and there are plenty of those. It takes a little bit extra courage and zeal because often it's less obvious how you will profit from them, which is part of our objective as capitalists here and as investors here. Um, so I think our gift to the world uh, is enormous, um, um, but it can often be misplaced uh, into activities or, or outputs that are more uh, decremental rather than incremental in our value. The last thing I'll say is this. The disruption that is now <clears throat> unfolding from Silicon Valley across the planet is going to continue. And, you know, we're coming for white collar jobs next. Right. And so no, nothing is safe. The problem is that a lot of people are going to be put out of work. And the, the journey that is very classical in America, which is many places in the world, you can be fully minted at birth or fully minted after you graduate school of a certain type. In America, the contest and the challenge continues for your lifetime, which is both fair and unfair. But this movie is coming to your neck of the woods, too. That's how the world is going to be changed by the radical force of the United States and Silicon Valley. As a result of this, we have to we have to invest in people's futures because we're going to put a lot of people out of work. I, uh, and it's too easy to be ignorant or shameless about it. I heard a very famous investor in Silicon Valley talk about how fabulous it will be. I don't think he understood what he was saying, but how fabulous in his view would be when all the Uber drivers, the million dri the million professional drivers in the United States are put out of work by self-driving cars because then they'll be free to do all this other stuff. Well, well, the irony is we don't know how they're going to make any money for themselves. And so we have to prepare to retrain them. And not everyone can be a software developer. Not everyone can be an engineer. Not everyone can work at Tesla or SpaceX. So we have to prepare for that. So that's the, that's the corollary to our needing to invest in more flying cars. We have to prepare people to be able to drive these flying cars. Thank you, Michael. That is most interesting. I'd love to debate that a little more, but we don't have the time. Uh, but I'll, I'll pass it on to Amir now for his comments. Okay, so first of all, that was quite a dark look at the world and specifically Silicon Valley. Now, I know you are referring more to the Facebook and the Google and maybe the Twitter rather than the many, many hardworking entrepreneurs that gave a lot for what me, my colleagues refer to as the fifth industrial revolution. If you follow the, the history from the 20th century with, with fourth industrial revolution and the use and, and basically that brought us Facebook, the use of, of technology to better the corporation shareholders, the fifth industrial revolution is looking at the world and its citizens of the global world as its shareholders. That's kind of summarizing what the fifth industrial revolution. If you want to follow more on that, you might want to listen to um, uh, to Salesforce uh, uh, that's spearing the, the movement. Anyway, go back to some practical uh, discussion here. Just like with the way COVID been handled and governments were forced to open their extremely conservative way of approaching new technologies, allowing new ways of creating vaccines to enter. And approvals went to, to uh, these new vaccines that helped us take control, hopefully take control in, in most of the world over this uh, scary uh, pandemic that almost, uh, almost took down you know, uh, major economies. Go back to what I believe is exactly uh, the trend that I see happening uh, since uh, the beginning of of uh, of this year, and it is practically 
clearing, clear understanding that the first thing that we must take care of is healthcare. You know, democratization of healthcare is a key component to enable people to move to the next key focus, which is education. As you said, as, as, as you said, Michael, yes, technology will take many millions of jobs away, but like you said, training is critical component and training being education is, is the next thing that's going to come up, but you have to keep people healthy first. I started in education, you know, and, and, and realized that you need to first focus on making sure that people are, are healthy. I defined, I don't know how you guys and, and lady is looking at, at, the, at education, but for me, uh, it all, it all starts from, from the ability for people to have equal access. About five years ago, I stood in front of the graduating class of, uh, of uh, Stanford, uh, uh, the, the medical school, and uh, speaking to them, uh, showing them a demo that we have created for uh, a surgical uh, procedure and telling them after the great uh, excitement that uh, the whole uh, the whole room had with what we showed them, I told them just imagine that your amazing facilities that so few of the people in the world have access to would be potentially be available within you know ten years to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people to be able to log in, work in a completely emulated virtual lab that exactly simulates the Stanford lab. And you can all learn as good by the best teachers, by the best professors out there. And, and, and just to make it clear, today surgeons are actually, in most cases, getting their first experience on a human in a, in a live surgery, uh, um, in, 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 on, you know, on the first time actually working, you know, performing surgery on a, on a, on a patient. That's the first time they have that level of training. We, we see the great opportunities to bring education to healthcare and then to bring healthcare as a, as a whole by that allowing, you know, uh, the people to, have access to tools that will allow them to to transition from whatever job they're becoming obsolete by by robotics and other uh, technologies. Okay. And I yeah. think, I think I'm I'm sorry sorry Silicon here. Valley is doing an unbelievable job, just like Silicon Valley in Israel and the rest of the world. Thanks, Amar. Uh, that was again an exciting vision, and uh, which I share. Uh, but we are running desperately short of time, so I'm going to move to uh, Avi uh, for his comments. Avi, could you just keep them to three minutes uh, or so, and then we have a chance to give it to Andrew, and then we'll have a chance to wrap it up. So we have only exactly eight minutes left in the session. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Avi. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I, I said I can be even quicker than that if you need me to to move on to the next points. But essentially, I think a lot of the panelists uh, which we are pointing to is that you know there is a need, there is a definite need in the industry across different industries to drop the info asymmetry, right? And which is what our um, experience has been also, because some of this info asymmetry, at least I, what I found when I started dealing with this new company uh, that we are creating, is those asymmetry barrier has been currently in place to guarantee sort of profit margins for the large insurers, for example. Right now, insurance, especially to farmers that we deal with, is a gamble, you know, because it's like the best, but it's also the best replacement for sort of public sector safety net, right? But why should insurance be such a gamble? I mean, you know, we have worked in all over the world in my last job as like a telecom guy, you know, where actually for underbank people and people with no savings bank or you know pension fund insurance can 
provide all those guarantees pretty much right so but essentially it's like a strategy problem you know the way we felt you know is that extends into to this sort of binary tech right so what we have been trying to do and again from our own perspective is how do you provide insurance and also assurance to people who don't understand risk management instead of it being a gamble or like a lottery right so 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 and this is one way we think that it gives sort of an authentic no nod almost to humanity or creates opportunities for innovation for shared humanity and and that is why we decided and that could be sort of my own bias because i was in telecom as to treat the phone as the most important farm equipment and build all solutions you know for the farming community around that because while the insurance uh, penetration is very poor across different parts of the world still in the poor and developing world now the cell phone penetration is pretty good so so what we are focusing on is using deep tech for good and that's how um, i think we have been running the trials and looking at that entire problem uh, uh, that we are trying to solve is from that perspective how do you use deep tech but still make it um, sort of information asymmetry independent thank you avi uh, i'll pass it on now to andrew for, for the last word and then i'll try to summarize all right last word um I, i'm going to pick up on something michael said you you talked about silicon valley as a metaphor uh, uh and i think that's right but i want to i want to hone in on metaphor um uh because innovation uh is in a sense a metaphor uh and most of this conversation has um uh, uh used innovation as a uh, almost a synonym for technology uh and, and and of course um you know in in many respects innovation is about technology today but when we're talking about innovation for humanity uh i actually think metaphor and story is um the great frontier uh to transform humanity. Uh I don't think health and education are the first and second uh requirements for innovation in humanity. I think equality is the first horizon. Um and equality is itself a metaphor. Um it's uh it's part of a story uh about who we are and who we want to be. uh and until we can find a way to change the metaphor for our society to start with equality um innovation through technology or anything else is going to fail uh, uh, let, me just, let, let me just let me just tell you something very important about diversity equity and inclusion it's exactly what is the focus and it's the number one problem and it is to be resolved by education and if you are looking to anti racism and discrimination that's mental health and that's the two I, I, that I, 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 don't, i don't disagree that uh education is foundational and so is health for everyone the point i'm trying to make is that innovation for humanity requires a story a goal a vision that is based in metaphor not in technology uh and and until um uh until we um find a way to broadly change the metaphor for our society uh to one of equality rather than say competition and triumph um uh we're going to fail uh we have failed we just lived through a massive failure uh we lived through a pandemic that um uh reminded us not that there are rich people and poor people or that some people have more stuff than other people um but that some people get sick and die uh and um uh and and that's going to continue to be the case um uh unjustly and and unequally uh until we change the metaphor that we want our institutions and our businesses um to um start with not to be um forced or regulated uh 
into subservience. To okay, thanks. So, uh, thanks, uh, Andrew. So, with that last word, let me kind of bring bring uh, bring this to closure. Trying to integrate the various remarks, which for me really converge around the same theme. And uh, the way I would summarize this uh, for the entire panel's remarks is really, I think, the need for a changing of the mindset of us as business people, where our our customer, our, our goal is, you know, our, the, the, the segment we wish to serve is the broader humanity rather than you know, the specific niche we are, you know, we are developing. You know, we will, we are, not every business can serve every person on, the, on this planet. But the approach, I think, the mindset with which we approach these things is how can I universalize my impact with a view to achieving these various sort of uh, objectives, which are intended in the sense to benefit a shared humanity. And, and that is, I would say, more of a mindset issue. You can call it a metaphor where you're, you know, your approach is essentially saying uh, really to not uh, say to win or lose for myself or win or lose market share. But broadly, in the end, I, I may be going after market share. You know, I may be so I'm, I'm doing no work. You know, my work is useless if nobody's buying anything that I'm producing. Uh, that's certainly not not the intent. But the intent is that whatever I do is at the end, at the margin, benefiting the entire humanity as opposed to benefiting my current set of shareholders that or stakeholders that I've been servicing. And if that's the overall mindset, I think, you know, we within whatever what we are doing and which is all different, you know, we end up, I think, you know, in the same collective direction. So that's kind of, you know, what I'm taking away from this conversation. Uh, you know, there's a large amount of convergence in thinking. Uh, in that general direction, I think... Uh, and clearly, I think we wouldn't have had this convergence uh, a year ago or two years ago uh, in the same manner, but for uh, the experience we've been through, uh, you know, in, the, in this pandemic, I think there is no doubt left, in, I think, in anybody's mind that, listen, if we are not in this together, we are all sunk. And I think this is going to come home in climate change as well. Yeah. You know, it's 95 degrees in Washington today. You know, it's never been so warm in my 30 years in D.C., uh, so again, we can debate on the science, but the fact is that when something as universal